All right, today we're going to talk about how to load up Betaflight 4.1 with the RPM filter support on any F3 board. I'll drop the link in the description below for this repo. The hexes aren't in order, alphabetical order for some reason, so don't let that throw you off. For me, I needed the Crazy B F3 for spectrum support. Do note that on the Crazy Bs and some others that it's calling out if it's spectrum, fly sky, or free sky. That was a way to divide things up a little bit to save some space to get everything packed in there. And it does have the RPM filter supported on here with some overclocking support that you're going to need. And then also the VTX table support in here as well. After you have the hex file downloaded, you just go into Betaflight hit uh, load firmware local, click the hex file, then hit flash. You don't have to worry about setting all this stuff up here uh, if you're loading it from local. Then just hit flash and flash it right to your board. Don't forget before you do the flash up, go into the CLI dump, be again before you flash it, and do a dith all. Type that in and then just grab this all and do a copy and copy that to a notepad file somewhere or something and just save that even if you're not going to paste it back in because actually i'm going to recommend not pasting it back in for right at this moment the little things you can definitely paste back in that without worrying about anything is the all the osd stuff which is kind of a pain to set up from scratch so anything that says osd like set osd you can paste that back in after you flash up and a lot of the other stuff as well i'm going to be talking about uh, the pid tune on this a little bit and then we'll go into another video on uh, more depth on that kind of an exploration of logging some of these things because logging is uh, a wolf is like a unicorn they're pretty rare nobody ever really sees them but uh, i did a bunch of stuff on that uh, over the last couple of weeks the next thing you're going to want to do is make sure you have either jesc or their bl heli 32 escs on it which they're not going to be BL Heli 32 ASC. So you're going to need JESC on these little whoops or micros, especially if you have an F3 free board. I highly doubt you're going to have a BL Heli 32. So get JESC. Again, I'll drop a link in the video description and put a card to the upper right for where you can uh, see my video on how to get JESC and get it loaded up. Once JESC is loaded up, all you have to do is check on the bi-directional support. Another thing you're going to need to do that I recommend is set your PID and gyro loop rate to 2K2K. Do make sure to set your motor poles to 12 instead of 14. Do count them up. It should be 12 for any micro, but just double check. After you have that all set up, we're going to go into the PIDs tab here. Then we're going to the filter settings. And then down here, you'll see the RPM filter. It should be enabled, but make sure it's enabled. And also, if you want to save a little bit of phase delay, you can go to two harmonics, but I would not go below two. Just looking at a bunch of logs, that second harmonic, when you're at low throttle, comes into play. When you're at high throttle, I don't see it so much, but when you're down at like 25% throttle or 10% throttle, that second harmonic's hovering around the 400 to 600 hertz range, which is helping tamp down noise up there where your fundamental frequency, your, your primary motor peaks are down around you know, the 100 hertz to 200 hertz range. So it, it does help in that case, and that's where the two harmonics, I would say, are definitely a must. Three, I don't think it really helps or hurts at all because the phase delay is so low with that third harmonic. I think it's like less than 0.1 milliseconds or something. It's, it's pretty low. So leave the defaults, change it to 100, maybe even 80 there if you wanted to. You can play around with that if you want or just leave it. It's fine. You can see what my settings are here. I would set this, the dynamic notch, to medium. And I would set the width to zero, so you just have one notch, and then set the Q factor to 250. What that does is these dynamic notch changes are making up for the phase delay add we're getting on the RPM filter. So you say, well, you know, it's, it's really the same phase delay, so how does this help? And yes, that's true, but you'll see the attenuation if you log it or just listen to the motors. You can hear that the attenuation is more so that the you're getting smoother traces which again is key because if you notice when i pop through the tab there we have a d of 80 so it's a really high d gain now many can say well lower your d gain you don't need a d gain that high that's not true you do i have logs to back it up and it also agrees with project mockingbirds you know i started this tuning session putting in the mockingbird settings and they're pretty good now on this specifically for a mobula they had a p to d ratio a little higher i think their p was 90 and the d was 70. so i found out that I was getting some bounce back there so brought those together it looks like it's a one to one at least on a mobula 7 and then if i bump those gains up a little higher um, got better flight performance 
been doing a bunch of logs on this and, and flights. So it's not just the logs. It's you, you go out with flying at first and you say, okay, that I think that's better. I feel it better, especially when you're doing back-to-backs. It's pretty simple. And it's acro outdoors to really push it. Uh, flying around indoors in angle mode, it doesn't really push the PID loop that much. So you can't really tell the difference between a lot of things. But when you go outside, you can definitely tell the difference. You can see my settings here I've kind of landed on. I have a 1.5 multiplier on both of these and for the sliders and that's it that's the filter tune so that's a little preview here of what i've been found out with doing the black box analysis and tuning on this nobula 7. finally we want to go into the motors tab plug in some batteries and it's interesting with these boards that everything's all in one even with the usb plugged in you will see that your motor errors when you go into the motors tab will go from 100 percent to, to down to zero now you can see on motor one here i'm getting some errors I do have my batteries plugged in, but this was flashing this way either way. So I'm gonna go ahead and ramp this up a little bit. I do have the props on in this case, so. But uh, you can see my errors are down there. I was getting some on number one. So it's interesting with these that I was getting a low amount of motor errors without overclocking turned on, but when I would fly it, it was twitching and it wasn't right. And I was doing some testing before the release of this branch. So basically what that's telling me is although the percentages here on the desk are okay when it was in flight and doing more computational stress, that utilization percentage was going up and it was getting some signal errors, which was, was no good. It was primarily just aimed at no motor one. And if you are having such issues, you can log it. There's a D shot RPM errors. So that's how you can kind of confirm where that those twitches are coming from. You can log that during a flight and you can see the error percentages in a log again during flight. And those were getting up to 100 uh, and spiking and so on and so forth. So that's how we knew what the issue is. So to solve that issue, and the reason I go through this is you could try it on your flight control board without the overclocking and see if it works. You know, 2K, 2K, just set it up like I showed. Uh, you probably don't have a black box logger, but just go fly it and see if you get twitching. If you do get twitching at 2K, 2K, you can go into the CLI here and type in get overclock, and you can see your overclocking variable. Now, when you see it, it will say over, uh, CPU overclock equals off, and we want to change that. There's a couple settings here. If you have a really old board that doesn't use a VCP port for the USB connection, so meaning when you go into the ports tab, it just has UART1 here, and it doesn't say USB VCP. Then the overclocks you would use here are the 80, 88, 96, so on and so forth. Uh, I would not go right up to the 128 megahertz. I would probably, I'm running 120. I know other people are running 120, seems to be safe. So you would use these to overclock. I would recommend just trying to go right to 120. Do make sure to do a diff all and save that off because what will happen if it's too high and the board locks up, you can just reflash the board. So you could get into beta flight. You might have to use the, the pins to get it into DFU mode, plug it back into beta flight, reflash it, and then paste your stuff back in. And that obviously would have been too high of an overclocking rate. And then you'd have to do a lower one. For anybody that's VCP USB support, which I think is going to be primarily everybody, uh, VCP has been the way it's been used for a long time now, you would need to use these megahertz values up here that say that underscore VCP below. Them. And you have to type that all in. So it would be set CPU overclock equals 120 MHZ underscore VCCP, right? Now, what that is going to do is it's special code. It's a new feature only in these performance editions, but it will overclock it, but it's only going to overclock when it's not plugged into USB. So when the USB is plugged in, it will not overclock the board so that you can connect to the configurator and do your thing. You can see here I'm at 27% utilization, not a problem. But when I'm not plugged in and I power it up with the batteries, it will boot the board. It will detect if a USB is plugged in or not. If a USB is not plugged in, then it will reboot the board in overclocking mode. And you'll, you'll hear the beeping of your ESCs or buzzer are a little different. There's like some extra beeps in there. So you can kind of hear it boot and reboot. I don't know if it technically reboots or not, but whatever it does, it switches into its overclocking mode. So I needed to do that, and I'm doing that at the 120 megahertz for it to work. Another tip on this is when I was plugging my 
Mobula into my laptop using my docking station, like plugging into the USBs in the back of the docking station versus just plugging into the USB directly on my laptop. It was not recognizing that it was plugged into USB either fast enough or at all, and it wouldn't recognize the board after I'd implemented the overclocking. So if you do have that issue and you're plugging into like a USB hub or something else, just plug your device directly into your laptop or computer's onboard USB port and make sure that's working. The other factor is I'm having a Windows 7 PC here. It's probably going to get upgraded at the end of the year to Windows 10. So maybe it's a Windows 7 in combination with the docking station thing. I don't know, but it's a situation I had. So be aware of that if you're setting overclocking on and then your computer is no longer recognizing it. Okay, well that is it and how you can get Betaflight 4.1 with VTX tables with the RPM filter on your F3 flight control boards, which I think is going to be a big hit for these little micros out there that come with F3s over the last year. Winter season's coming, so this is great. Big thanks to Joe for doing the performance editions, for doing JESC to try to get, you know, keep some of this old hardware alive. He didn't need to do any of this. He could have just did all the RPM filtering code and not worried about BL Hell ES. And, you know, the BL Hell 32 devs weren't going to go back, right? Because they make money on licensing of BL Heli. 32 on BL Heli 32 um, ESCs from manufacturers. So there's no motivation for them to go back and get RPM filtering to work on BL Heli S ESCs. Thanks everybody, and I hope this helped.